Witchcraft in the late medieval and early modern European world was a highly gendered crime. The majority of victims were women, but a significant percentage were men, and in some regions, men made up the majority of the accused. Who were these male witches? What were they accused of? And how do they fit into the larger picture of witch trial history? Find out today on Footnoting History. Hi, and welcome to Footnoting History. I'm your host, Kristen. And today, we're going to be talking about witches. I know. It's an exciting topic, and it's not hard to see why. It's dramatic and awful and spooky. And hey, maybe that's why you're here. Those are a lot of the same reasons that pre-modern people were fascinated with witchcraft, too. Historians have studied this topic from multiple angles for a very long time. Witchcraft persecutions tell us a lot about politics and law and religion, gender and economics and fantasy. There's a lot of culture and society wrapped up in European witch trials, and about a million points of view to study them from. In case this is your first introduction to witchcraft history, I'm going to start with a little contextualization. What was happening in late medieval and early modern Europe that led to large witch persecutions, before turning our focus to a particular segment of victims that has traditionally been overlooked in the historiography? If you'd like more on other aspects of the history of witchcraft, you can listen to previous footnoting history episodes on necromancy, the Malleus Maleficarum, and punishing witches in 16th century England. But for now, let the witch hunt begin. During the period between the 1400s and the 1700s, thousands upon thousands of people in Europe were accused of forming pacts with the devil and participating in a secret, evil conspiracy against their neighbors and the world at large. Despite what the anthropologist Margaret Murray argued in the beginning of the 20th century, historians do not believe that these accusations were based on some sort of pre-Christian religious cult survival. They also do not believe that there were really people performing satanic rituals, which is what a man named Montague Summers was arguing around the same time as Murray. But these persecutions were incredibly damaging, they claimed many thousands of lives, and they ruined far more. They happened all over, in secular and religious courts, in villages and big towns, in Catholic and Protestant areas, and all kinds of people both participated and were caught up in the witch trials. In 1437, a man named Johannes Nieder wrote a text called the Formicarius, which means the anthill in Latin. Nieder was a man from southern Germany, and he was an inquisitor. And an inquisitor was a person whose job it was to travel around and locate, and get rid of, any people whose beliefs were at odds with official Catholic Church teachings, and who refused to mend their ways. The Formicarius is a really wonderful text for historians, because it lays a lot of the groundwork for later witch hunting. It's considered part of the demonological literature. And yeah, that's a thing. There's a whole genre of literature about demons and what they do, and what you, dear reader, should do about them. The Formicarius is structured as a fictional dialogue between a master theologian and a student who asks lazy questions that the theologian then has to go off on long, didactic monologues to answer. Think of it like a really bad, boring play about religious punks. The theologian goes on in one section to talk about this guy he knew. He calls him Peter. And Peter was from Bern in Switzerland, which was in the Diocese of Lausanne. And Pete apparently burned himself lots of witches and drove out hordes of others from the area. In an effort to boost the credibility of the Formicarius, the theologian said he corroborated what Pete told him with an unnamed Benedictine monk who quite conveniently, used to be a magician who summoned demons to do his bidding. So, Anonymous Monk here knows all the signs, and is an expert in those who do bad magic. Oh, and also, says the theologian, I heard this stuff from another inquisitor who convicted lots of witches too, so listen up. I'm going to tell you some stuff. Nieder gives you what historians consider the first real picture of the witch's Sabbath. His fictional theologian, who, let's be real, is neater in thin disguise, 
talks about how witches would meet in an agreed-upon fixed location, in secret of course, and do all kinds of horrible things that tick off a lot of societal taboo boxes. They kidnapped babies, they boiled their little bodies in their cauldrons, and made potions out of the goo and used it in their bad magic. They would consort with demons, they would renounce Christianity and all of its rituals, and promise to do sacrilegious things like stomp on the cross and stuff like that. Usually there's some kind of orgy happening at the Sabbath, a feast or a wild sex party or both. Being a witch was not a passive act, and it was not a solitary profession. Witches had to pledge allegiance to the devil and then go out into the world to do his bidding. The Formicarius is considered the earliest document that gives historians a concise picture of the witch-like activities that will become very common in later persecutions. And coming hot on the heels of the Formicarius was the first real wave of witch trials in Western Europe. Between 1438 and 1528, 27 people were put on trial for witchcraft in that diocese of Lausanne. In these trials, the accused are all basically asked the same questions, in the same order, and when the interrogators don't get the answers they want, they use torture until they get them. This is where you start to see what is often referred to in the historiography as the cumulative concept of witchcraft which is kind of a checklist of witchy things that strongly echoes the Formicarius. The pact with the devil, the renunciation of Christianity, the Sabbath, the community and conspiracy, the performance of bad magic, all these things that reappear over and over in witchcraft prosecutions. Many historians are critical of the cumulative concept of witchcraft. It's not always a neat fit, and not every note gets hit every time, but this idea of what witches did is pretty recurrent in the sources. Witchcraft history is complicated for a lot of reasons, not least of which is the incredibly incomplete nature of the source material. There are a lot of gaps in our knowledge of witch trials. We only have records for a fraction of what happened. Partly this is because stuff gets lost, or it wasn't properly cared for and it deteriorated, and part of it is that when things were at their most crazed, no one had time to keep good records, and so they never existed at all. For example, in the Duchy of Lorraine, which is today an area in northeastern France, between 1570 and 1630, there were about 2,000 witch trials, and we only have full records for about 400 of them. In general, historians don't have nearly as much as they would like, and sometimes the information they get is only partial, so it is a very complicated puzzle to put back together, and it's one that is often missing a lot of pieces. Especially when you're talking about the demographics of witches, those details that tell us something about the person who stood accused. We base a lot of our assumptions on the gender of accused witches on names, and sometimes we don't even have that. From the work that has been done with the sources that we do have, the picture of the witch is a pretty stereotypical one that you will probably recognize. A solid majority of accused witches were older, many were unmarried, and many were poor. Basically, they were the weakest and most vulnerable members of society. They also tended to have cultivated reputations for being kind of cranky. They were individuals who lived on the margins of society, and they were troublemakers who fought with their neighbors and sometimes liked to use salty language. They often had previous run-ins with the law. Many descriptions talk about the witch's reputation for moral and religious deviancy, and it seems to have been something that had gone on for quite a while. There are, of course, lots of exceptions to the stereotypical picture, and there are many references to accused witches where demographic details are missing altogether, but this is the general picture. Additionally, witchcraft was a highly gendered crime, meaning that most of the accused, and we're talking like 75%, were women. The historian Lindau Roper talks a lot about the gendered nature of the crime of witchcraft and why women were more likely to be accused than men. A lot of it had to do with beliefs that women were gullible and stupid, superstitious and weak and just lustful in every possible way, and I know, 
you're probably rolling your eyes with me right now, but it is important to keep in mind that these beliefs were held by both men and women, and it's just part of the fabric of the larger story. Because of this overwhelmingly female witch demographic, the male witch kind of got ignored in the historiography for a long time. There were some that tried to argue that focusing on the male witch somehow detracted from the real crime, which was the wholesale persecution of women, and to focus on men was to do yet another gross disservice to women and a very long history of disservices. That argument is pretty problematic for a lot of reasons, and most historians today do not argue that persecution of witches equaled persecution of women and studying one segment of victims does not detract from the importance of another. There were some geographical regions in Europe where men were the majority of the accused. Laura Apps and Andrew Gao, whose book is included in the further reading list for this episode, have a chart where they map out all of the gender ratios for witchcraft persecutions. In Burgundy, men made up 52% of the accused. In Estonia, it was 60% men. In Normandy, 73% of the accused were men, and Iceland's accused male witches stood at a whopping 93% of the total. In those first Lausanne trials, it was a majority men. There's probably no one easy answer as to why this was, but there are a few interesting explanations. First, despite the highly gendered nature of the crime, witchcraft was not a gender-exclusive club. All humans were thought to be vulnerable to the influence of the devil, and that first foundational text for witchcraft persecutions, the Formicarius, makes this pretty clear. Latin has different genders for different nouns, and Nieder pulls out both in his description of witches. He actually uses the masculine form of witch, Maleficius, far more often than he does the feminine form, Maleficia. Nieder even begins his section on witches with a story about a male witch named Stedelin, who confessed, after being tortured, to quite the spectacular crime spree. Stedelin claimed to be the chief witch, so not only was he bad to the bone, he was also upper-level management, which in and of itself is interesting when considering this incredibly gendered crime. Poor Stedelin may have been the first witch CEO to be named in the court records, but he definitely was not the last. There are vernacular terms for witch in the source material aside from the Latin, but like the Latin, these are also gendered. In French, the words are sorcière and sorcière. You probably can't tell the difference between what I just said because of my French pronunciation, but just know that the feminine form has an accent and an extra e. In German, the words are Hexenmeister for a male witch and Hex for a female witch. In Old English, the words are Wicca, W-I-C-C-A, for male witch, and Wicca, W-I-C-C-E, for female witch. And this is how we ultimately arrive at our English word for witch, one that was used to talk about both men and women. Langlin uses the word witch in his famous 14th century poem, Piers Plowman, and he's very clear about who he means. The line reads, quote, Crucify him, said a catchpole, which was a petty bailiff or court figure. Crucify him, said a catchpole. I warrant him a witch. The word warlock does literally exist in the medieval and early modern worlds, but is not so much used in the court records and seems to be more of a 19th century thing. The Middle English Compendium gives us a few definitions of how warlock was being used. One has to do with being shackled and has absolutely nothing to do with magical practitioners. Another is a name for any variety of plants in the mustard family. The final possibility is perhaps a bit more on brand for our purposes. This warlock is defined as a traitor, a criminal, a deceiver, one who is in possession of occult knowledge or who practices sorcery, a damned soul or a monstrous creature. So definitely kind of witchy, but not precisely fitting into that demonic conspiracy picture of the witch. 
Warlock isn't really how people are referring to men accused in the witch trials. So, male witches were witches, and they were not outside the realm of possibility, but what were they up to? What were they accused of? Who were these guys? First, let's consider their alleged crimes. When you're considering what male witches were accused of, there is a fair amount of overlap with female witches. They, too, were sexually seduced by demons, just foxy female demons. For all the mud that gets slung at women for their supposedly voracious sexual appetites, men also get criticized for their supposedly inherently sexually aggressive natures, and they were seen as definitely prone to lust. Male witches participated in all Sabbath activities. They go out into the community to perform their harmful spells because, you know, that's in the witch's job description. But sometimes their spells have more to do with animals and fields, since that was their gendered workspace and expertise, and they were less likely to be involved in spells focusing on the home and children. All kinds were thought to operate with a familiar, and familiars were these little demonic helpers who took the form of animals. They could be any type of animal, a toad, a hare, and of course a cat, but wolves were far more likely to be the witching buddies of men. On the Footnoting History website for this episode, you can see a depiction of a male witch palling around with his wolf familiar. Sometimes male witches were believed to be able to actually transform themselves into wolves and cause a lot of damage that way. There are a lot of werewolf trials in Central Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries that centered around men. Witches were supposed to take care of their familiars, and they had to feed them, from a little nub hidden somewhere on their body. And witch trials often talk about intimately searching for this mark. There are certainly gendered aspects to this belief. It's breastfeeding in the Upside Down, and the searches have been argued to be manifestations of sexual fantasy. But men were not immune to this type of thing, and witch hunters searched for and found these marks on men too. So, in theory, that's what male witches were up to, but what specifically made them targets? Some historians believe that when men were accused of witchcraft, they were just kind of swept up in other accusations. Where torture was used and accused witches were pressured to name more witches and more witches, at a certain point you kind of run out of people you personally know and just start naming people you've heard of. The most well-known people in towns were often men. Where there were big hunts, and there were big hunts in most areas of Europe, more men did tend to get caught up in the net, and it probably does explain a bit of that overall 25% of witches who were men. Their explanation has to do with family reputation. There was an idea that witchiness ran in families, and that family members had a lot of motive and opportunity to corrupt others into joining the devil's ranks. Some historians believe that it was this family reputation for witchiness that often raked in male victims, and they trace the original blame back to women, but it is not always clear who deserves the original blame. John Saymond was a witch who was accused of few times in Essex, England. The first time he shows up in the records is 1560, and John is back again a few times until it appears his luck ran out and he was hanged in 1587. But he's not associated with a female witch the first time he shows up in the sources. At his second court appearance in 1572, his wife Joan is accused as well, but since John is the first identified witch, it seems likely that she was accused because of him and not the other way around. Giles Corey was an accused witch who had a bad reputation that he worked pretty hard to cultivate. Giles Corey was a man who lived and died during the 1692 Salem trials in Massachusetts. His wife Martha was one of the early critics of the young girls who claimed to be afflicted by the specters of witches, and of the two of them, Martha was accused first. And that probably didn't help Giles, but he had been in and out of trouble himself for years. He'd stolen stuff. He was accused of arson. He beat to death a mentally impaired handyman. He was generally described as a very, quote, 
quarrelsome and contentious bad neighbor, end quote. Many accused witches were average farmers who got on their neighbor's nerves, like Giles Corey, but historians are looking a little more in-depth at the social makeup of accused witches, and they are finding some pretty interesting trends. And one has to do with who was believed to be more likely to engage in magic of any kind. The practice of ordinary magic was common in many areas of pre-modern Europe. And lots of areas had people who had side jobs and magical tasks like spells and charms and fortune telling. It really depended on the geographic area and the associated day jobs, whether these magical practitioners tended to be men or women. In areas of northern Scandinavia, many of these semi-pro magicians were men, and in an area known as Fenoscandia, a lot of the accused came from an indigenous people called the Sami. The Sami people lived on the fringes of an already pretty remote area, and they were not quickly assimilated to the Christianized communities nearby, or at least that's what the Christian writers said. The Sami had reputations for magic, and in Sami culture, the practice of magic was gendered male. So, you already have a pretty marginalized community, and when the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation got going, people in charge of religion in the court started cracking down on magic. This was true in other parts of Europe as well, but in Scandinavia, magical castes of people had these especially giant bullseyes on them. Sami were by no means the only category of men associated with magic. Many Europeans believed that blacksmiths had a kind of supernatural edge, and people often sought out blacksmiths for spells. Blacksmiths, of course, worked with a lot of iron, and iron was believed to have apotropaic powers, meaning that it had the ability to affect luck one way or the other. Maybe it had something to do with the tools of the trade. Blacksmiths worked a lot with fire, and that had a lot of powerful associations, sometimes demonic associations. And maybe there were even a few dissatisfied customers out there. Although Heath Ledger's awesome A Knight's Tale has a female blacksmith in it, blacksmithing was a predominantly male profession. There are also a lot of shepherds and herdsmen who were accused of witchcraft, and again, these were largely male-dominated jobs. Like the Sammy and the blacksmiths, these guys had reputations that were conducive to witchcraft accusations. Sometimes their confessions say they were basically the musical entertainment at the Sabbaths. They played pipes and drums, and those were the sorts of things that the devil wanted, and the sorts of things that shepherds and herdsmen knew how to do. They also had to be able to know how to provide veterinary care for their flocks. So they were well-versed in healing, and healing often had a magical lean to it in the pre-modern era. Shepherds and herdsmen were people who had reputations for being kind of loners. They moved around a lot, and they caused trouble. There were a few popular uprisings that were associated with shepherds in the 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries. Shepherds and herdsmen were not the only suspicious people who were on the move in pre-modern Europe. In the 16th and 17th centuries, there was a sharp increase in poverty, and there was a fair number of beggars roaming around, and that put people on edge. A historian named Alan McFarlane has a really famous study on English witch trials, where he argues that people got accused because they had asked for help and their neighbors said no, either because their neighbors were jerks or because they were poor too and weren't realistically able to help. And then they felt super guilty about not helping, so they projected that guilt. This is an extremely religious society, and both Catholics and Protestants were taught that the right thing to do was to help their neighbors, and so when they didn't, or couldn't, well, they couldn't blame themselves, so they made the beggar into the enemy. Where begging was a more visible, itinerant affair, where beggars tended to be more men, witches tended to run male. All of this goes a long way to account for the significant presence of men in the ranks of the accused. The structures of social and religious hierarchies and gender norms all had enormous effects on how witchcraft persecutions played out, and they were not a one-size-fits-all. Cultures varied drastically, 
local concerns and animosities were highly variable factors. And of course, during those large scale hunts, all bets were off. The reasons are kind of endless and never always the same, which is of course why the history of witchcraft persecution is just so frightfully exciting. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. From all of us here at Footnoting History, a special thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. And until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. <laughs>